Good afternoon and welcome to the December webinar presented by the Recruitment, Training and Support Center at the Federation for Children with Special Needs. My name is Janie Greco and I am the Training and Support Specialist at RTSC. Today's webinar, Mental Health and the IEP, is being presented by Mary Beth Landy. Mary Beth comes to the Federation with over nine years of experience as a family advocate, specifically in the areas of mental health, adoption, and trauma. Before and during graduate school, she worked at everything from a youth counselor to a doggy daycare manager to a nanny and my personal favorite, a personal chef and bartender. Her graduate work included courses in social psychology and adolescent counseling. Our technical producer today is Hannah Stahlkamp. If you are interested in learning more about the Federation, please go to our website at FCN, fcsn.org and explore all the different programs, including the Special Education Surrogate Parent Program, which sponsors these webinars. Our webinar today is being recorded and will be available on the RTSC website under the link Resources for Everyone. During the webinar, please type your questions in the toolbox and feel free to engage with other attendees as appropriate. I will monitor the questions as they come in and to the extent time allows, we will try to answer them before the end of the hour. If your question is not answered live, please send us an email and we will do our best to follow up with you. Welcome, Mary Beth. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Janie. I appreciate being asked to do this. Bear with me while I work through my te technical difficulties on getting slides to move. Can All right, hold on one second, folks. Great, thank you. New setup for me, I'm used to being in the call center, so <laughs> being live on the computer is not what I'm used to. So um, welcome everybody, and I really appreciate everybody taking the time out of their day, because I know from my listening to the webinar, sometimes it's hard to get a moment out of your hectic day. Um, so mental health and the IEP. OK. There we go. So for the agenda today, what I just wanted to briefly go over what we'll be talking about. Um, we're going to talk about some of the common diagnoses that you'll see on IEPs or with kids. Um, there is such an enormous range of mental health issues that our kids face today. Um, what we thought we'd do is some of the more common ones that you would see. And we're always here, um, the call center or Janie, um, is a great reference, um, anyone at the Federation, to find out more information about um, different diagnoses. Um, and my background and my recommendation is also to utilize um, NAMI, which stands for the National Alliance for Mental Illness. Um, they happen to be a neighbor of ours here in, this, in the office. Um, and they are a great resource of uh, information as well as pamphlets and things that can be sent out to parents. So um, I always recommend utilizing them. And Google is a great reference um, to just look up things if you're not sure. Um, I specifically go into um, depth about uh, some community-based services that we have. We'll talk a little bit about accessing the curriculum, um, how to get things on IEPs, um, related services. What is the least restrictive environment and is that necessarily um, the best thing for an individual child? Um, we'll talk a little bit about discipline and um, we did do a webinar last month on manifestation, uh, so we're not going to cover that in great detail, um, and, but we are going to concentrate on writing some really effective goals, because particularly for mental health, that can be sometimes the biggest challenge, just to be able to do that. So on we go. Where does one begin? Um, 
basically I'll just give you a little background of my history. Um, I um, was a child who was undiagnosed with a learning disability. I did not find out that I had dyslexia until I was actually in college. Um, I was in graduate school um, at the age of 32 when I was, disco when it was discovered that I had um, severe ADHD combination. Um, and uh, later on that led to some other issues. Um, I was definitely the H in ADHD as a child. As my mother liked to say, I was the easiest to bear and the hardest to raise. Um, but it, that was also a time when we didn't look at mental health with children. So um, I started out as a client of NAMI. Um, I then became a trainer for them, and I am also a support group facilitator for them. Um, I am a parent of two adoptive daughters. Um, they are biological siblings who have what I like to call the um, alphabet soup of diagnosis. Uh, they have ADHD. One of them is hyperactive and the other one is inattentive. And the two of those is what is called the combination, um, if you have both of those. Um, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and attachment issues. Um, later on, you'll hear us talking about reactive attachment disorder. One of my daughters has that as an attachment issue, and the other daughter has what's called disorganized attachment. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I have been a parent advocate for nine years. I have served as a family partner with Riverside Community Care, which is a community service agency. We'll talk about what those are later on. Um, my work as a parent advocate was really beneficial. Um, that is working with families who have children with mental illness. The drawback is we're not allowed to serve as an educational advocate for those families. And seeing that there was such a high need for an educational advocate who specializes in mental health, that brought me to the Federation for my training and has led me down the line to actually now work for the Federation. Um, if anyone has ever called the call center in the last several months, um, I am the call center coordinator, um, an information specialist, um, organizing the interns who work for us, as well as the advocates who are our lovely advocates who volunteer for us. Um, I also serve as a surrogate parent for two um, kids that are in the system, and I serve as a mentor to other advocates. Um, so the one thing about the Federation is everybody does a little bit of everything around here. So enough about me. Let's take a look at some of the, um, go on with some of the issues around mental health. I call mental health the non-casserole diagnosis. Um, if your child is in the hospital because um, they've been sick or, you know, has meningitis or something, everybody's worried about them and all your neighbors show up with casseroles for you and food. But when your child is diagnosed um, with a mental illness and has to be hospitalized for psychological reasons, no one, not only don't they show up with a casserole, but all of a sudden nobody, start, nobody talks to you anymore. Um, and one of the problems with it, one of the challenges is that it's, it's not a disability that people can see. So, um, you know, they may, they may see behaviors, but they don't necessarily see what the problems are. Um, there are no definitive tests for it. Um, you cannot go in and have blood work done and it will come up and tell you that, yes, you have bipolar disorder. Um, the diagnosing can sometimes be very difficult, as we'll get into later. Um, there are comorbid symptoms, and by comorbid it means just that um, symptoms lie in, in different realms, so there's multiple, there could be multiple diagnoses that have the same symptoms, so it's hard to work out whether this symptom, um, say of hyperactivity, may in fact be from an anxiety disorder or from an ADHD disorder, um, so there's a lot of overlapping symptoms. Um, it's definitely something that is misunderstood. Uh, we don't, unfortunately, have enough knowledge about how these disorders come about, um, whether some are predisposed, what is the triggering element, why does one child, um, even in twins, why does one child have a diagnosis and another one does not, depending on what, what the diagnosis are. Um, it's just really misunderstood. It's, it's um, 
science has not caught up yet to, to the fields of mental health. Um, there's definitely a lot of judgment and if you, if you work with children who have a mental health diagnosis, there's a lot of behavioral issues sometimes and judgment that if you were just a better parent, um, if you handled your child differently, that the behaviors would go away and therefore the disorder, you know, there wouldn't be problems. Um, and really from anybody who, who has heard me before knows that I don't believe that there are things, um, not that there aren't behaviors, but I believe behaviors are actually a manifestation of something else that's going on. Um, so they're more of, of a symptom of something um, as opposed to just behavior. Um, and many, many times um, I see this and I think Janie would agree that um, the education system does not necessarily see mental health as requiring special education services. Um, they may, in fact, think that things um, can be handled with behavioral plans um, or if you know, people talk more, if children communicate more, if parents were better. There's a variety of different reasons, but um, it's, it's a big challenge to, for mental uh, health to, be, to receive educational services. So um, right now, Janie's going to talk a little bit about some of the statistics. Thanks, Mary Beth. So I took a look at some recent statistics put out by NAMI. Um, they are based, uh, it's their latest report, I believe, 2010, which is a little bit old. Um, but um, it's, they are staggering, as Mary Beth has said. Um, so if you take the baseline of people that are living in Massachusetts, there's 6.5 million of us. And 67,000 of the children who are living in the Commonwealth have a serious mental health condition. Now I'm thinking because that's a statistic that has been gathered, those, those are kids that are either receiving services or have received a um, significant diagnosis through a psychiatrist or an MD. There are many kids who kind of go under the radar with their mental health issues, um, so they are not, I'm sure, in the count of 67,000. Another statistic that just always breaks my heart, having worked in the community with um, some kids that um, were suicidal or had completed suicides, um, that is the largest, set, the third largest cause of death for um, kids aged 15 to 24. Um, and uh, if you've ever been in a school system where a suicide has occurred or there's a contagion, um, it really impacts the community as a whole. Um, and that's when a crisis occurs and that's usually when the schools step up and take a look, a closer look at mental health issues in the district. And then an interesting statistics and, uh, statistic is that 46% of kids on IEPs over 14 have dropped out of school. We know a whole lot more about who those kids are. I've, I'm not going to go into it now. Um, they're not all kids with mental health issues, but certainly anybody who's been identified as having a disability has some issues um, being successful at school and um, the IEPs are in place to support those kids. So we wanted to go over a little bit about the regulations as defined for what a mental impairment, uh, emotional impairment uh, is. These are um, not all inclusive, meaning a child doesn't have to have all of these, um, but these are some of the explanations. An inability to learn that cannot be explained by intellectual, sensory, or health factors an inability to build or maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships with peers or teachers. Um, and this is a lot of times when you, you find um, that the school starts to recognize something going on, particularly if they're having um, negative relationships with their peers, um, such as fighting and things like that. Um, inappropriate behaviors or feelings uh, under normal circumstances. Um, People sometimes may call these uh, tantrums, 
um, which for a kid with mental health, they're not really tantrums, they're meltdowns. Um, or go, they go by a variety of different names, but we'll get into that a little bit later, the differences between them. But when something sets off a child or they behave um, in a way that doesn't necessarily um, tie into what's happening, um, that's usually a good indicator. Uh, the per pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression, um, that actually, will, you can see that in several different disorders we'll go into. Um, and by pervasive um, meaning longer than just a day or two or a, a shift, um, and it tends to develop physical symptoms or fears associated with personal or school problems. Um, particularly, I find a lot of um, stomach aches, headaches, some kids to the point of migraines. Um, uh, the statistics on kids getting migraines at school are staggering lately. Um, I'm hearing that more and more kids are missing school because they've had such bad headaches. So, um, But a lot of, you'll see a, a tendency for a lot of trips to the nurse's office because they're not feeling well. Um, in our particular family, we have, I have two kids, we call them hypo and chondriac. Um, because they're in the nurse's office for those unknown um, ailments that they really can't explain. So you'll find that to be common. So let's start with anxiety. It's, it, I think it's one of the diagnoses that gets overlooked or um, downplayed the most often um, and probably is really prevalent um, particularly with school systems, the more academics, the more pressure on kids, um, I think you, you will find that their anxieties are high. Um, as you can see in the, the graphic there with the kid trying to do their homework, I've seen that look way too often in our household. Um, but let's go over a couple of different types of anxiety. Separation anxiety, most people think of as something that happens just to little kids. Um, you know, when the babysitter comes for the first time and they haven't been away from their parents. Um, this is usually uh, the, it, it, the normal um, time that this would happen in separation anxiety would be considered a normal thing is when they are that age and they're being left for the first time. It's when they get a little bit older and they're in first grade and they have a problem when you leave, drop them off at school every time where it starts to become an issue um, or a fear of being separated at any time from the significant people in their life. Um, you know, you may see this in a child who can't go use the bathroom without having somebody go with them. Um, phobias, most people are familiar with that. There's a specific thing or event. Um, spiders um, are being a big one. Um, sometimes it's phobias. Kids are afraid of the dark. Um, so you'll see that a lot with children. Um, the social anxiety disorder, um, we have listed here being um, fear of being in groups, um, I'm sorry, let's just say, or public speaking. Um, so when kids get asked to get up in front of the class and work out a problem in the board, if it's really causing such an impact on them that they have that um, Deer, deer in headlight look to them, that fight or flight look to them. Um, it's usually an anxiety and not just a temporary or um, situational um, issue that's going on. Um, panic disorders, um, if somebody has ever gone through one, uh, they know they're just absolutely horrible and type of anxiety to go through. Um, that you literally feel this sense of not being able to breathe, the sense of um, absolute dread, um, and that's for sometimes for adults, they feel like they're having a heart attack or they're going to die. Um, so there's really strong physical reactions that happen with panic disorders and usually lasting for a good 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so it's not just this momentary situation. Um, so let's take a look at how it manifests itself in children. Um, the constant thoughts or fears of safety of self for parents um, is a big concern. Uh, a lot of parents will talk about their kids refusing to go to school and we see this um, everywhere from little kids with separation anxiety to um, 
as they start to get to middle school and high school where they'll start refusing to go to school because of their anxiety is so hard. Um, or they will, f in fact, go to school and then you'll get the phone call from school that they, they want you to come pick them up because they can't stay there. Um, frequent physical complaints, we said, the headaches, the stomach aches, um, extreme worries. Um, one of my daughters, definitely, who has anxiety, her extreme worries, um, I'll, I'll just give you an example, um, she'll worry so much about taking an exam but it's not just the exam that she's worried about. Her thoughts go to, if I don't do really well on this exam, I'm not going to get a good grade in the class. I'm not going to be able to go to a good college. I'm not going to get a good job, and therefore I'm not going to be successful in life. And that all happens in about a millisecond. But the, the worries are extreme. They go on for um, long periods of time. and she's not able to break them down into let me just worry about this small step I have to take here. Um, so that's, that's an example of, of the worry and how anxiety plays out. Um, overly clingy, um, that definitely happens even with teenagers where all of a sudden you can't get rid of them um, and you want to get rid of you like some time by yourself but you can't get rid of them. Um, panics or tantrum tantrums um, um, at times of separation, so we talked a little bit about that. Trouble sleeping or nightmares. Um, the one thing I do want to separate out here, um, there are two different things. There's a difference between a nightmare and a night terror and um, uh, when we get in a little bit further into some of the trauma things. I'll ask Janie to talk a little bit about what a night terror is. But trouble, kids who have trouble falling asleep, but also trouble staying asleep, that they can't sleep through the night is also an indication. Um, a loss of interest in a preferred activity. Um, one of the key things of finding out you know, whether a kid is struggling is they used to love to do something, um, Legos. So they used to love to play with Legos and now they don't touch it and they have no desire to play with them. Um, or um, ask a kid what their favorite movie is and they can't think of it. They, you know, I don't know. How many times have we heard? I don't know. Um, they're, um, you know, playing with their favorite friend is no longer an interest and there's nothing particular or situational that has caused that loss of interest. It's not like they've had, they've had a fight with their best friend and now they don't want to play with it. They're just not interested in the activity anymore. Um, overly vigilant, or, or we call it hypervigilance, um, where children are always aware of their circumstances, what's around them. They're always aware of um, trying to figure out how other people feel because they pick off how they pick up how they should feel. And should they be safe, but with the other adults around them, um, being overly sensitive to sound. If they find it different. Um, don't we all find going to the mall at Christmas time? This is probably the worst sensitivity time of the year, going to the mall. Um, the, it's just loud. Um, but for kids at school, it could be going to the auditorium for the Christmas concert. Um, could be something that's too difficult for them to do. Um, worrying about things before they happen. And as a lot of these seem like common things that people go through, these are usually to an extreme or they last for a long period of time. So worrying about things before they happen on a regular basis would be more a situation of anxiety than, um, again, just something I'm worried about the upcoming test. Um, I just want to um, put in a, something that will uh, help people understand. A lot of these um, symptoms that we're talking about, Mary Beth, happen to all of us. And clinically, people say that if they get in the way of your daily functioning, that's when it becomes a mental health issue. Correct. So, um, you know, we don't all, I mean, we all have anxiety to a certain extent. We all probably have depression to a certain extent, but when it gets in the way of what we want to do in a day is when it becomes cl clinically significant. Correct. Um, I wanted to address actually the last um, bullet point here on the screen, maybe overly quiet, um, compliant or eager to please, um, that may seem a little unusual as a sign of anxiety, um, but in fact, in that, that may be what every parent's looking for, so you may not actually want to bring it to anybody's attention, but for example, my youngest who is hyperactive, 
when she started out in high school, one of the teachers had literally said um, for her IEP meeting that she is quiet, she doesn't cause a problem, she, in fact he would like her to speak up more and everything. And, I, and he said, I see no signs of anxiety and I laughed and I said, have you ever met my daughter? She is hyperactivity. So that's her, how her anxiety plays out a lot of times is because she becomes quiet um, and just sits in the seat and doesn't cause a problem. So that's kind of the flip side of anxiety, how anxiety can look in children. Um, and, then, and that's just to be taken just as seriously as the child who can't sit in their seat. Um, depression. And again, this is a, another diagnosis. We all go through times of, you know, loss. We all go through situations where um, we find that we are melancholy or sad. It happens, it's about the duration and about the intensity. Um, that really causes the mental health diagnosis. So feeling sad and hopeless. Um, that's not usually a feelings um, that you would have as a typical five-year-old. So, you know, even, even children as young as that and younger can suffer from depression. Um, particularly, a, a good question is, so, you know, what's your favorite food to eat? And if a kid can't tell you what their favorite food is, because every kid has favorite food, um, that's usually a, a key, that they're, they're not happy about anything, nothing is appealing to them. Again, low self-esteem, you may start to see that was a, a characteristic of anxiety. This is where we talk about comorbidity. Um, it's also a symptom of depression. Lack of energy, um, you know, and I'm not talking about the typical teen who sleeps too much because they're now teenagers and they need to do that, but a, a kid who needs to take a nap after school every single day. Um, but starting to do poorly in school is, an, is definitely an indicator that something's going on, and that's what we like to bring to your attention, the indicators that you should be looking at something else. Um, restlessness. Um, for a lot of kids, they can't sit still even when they're depressed. Um, so there's almost both sides of the pendulum are here. When you're looking at these um, symptoms, you'll find that um, they can be either one minute really depressed. Um, if for a lot of kids, irritability is when they're irritability and, and they get upset about everything and irritable about everything, that happens to play out a lot for children um, as opposed to adults. That's a big symptom of depression in children. Um, more aggressive, um, it, verbally aggressive for a lot of times, sometimes kids can either become more explosive um, or more implosive or self-directed um, where they beat themselves up. Um, again, the, having the aches and pains for no known reasons. Um, we were talking about the physical symptoms before. Um, the change in eating habits. Sometimes some kids are um, binge eaters um, or what we adults call emotional eating um, or they have no appetite whatsoever. Um, and just to, for a point of clarification for people who don't know, um, suicidal ideation is the fixation of committing suicide, thinking about it, planning about it, but um, um, not being able to let go of that thought. So bipolar disorder. Um, this is, a, I think, a very misunderstood and um, confusing diagnosis. Not that the diagnosis, I should take that back, not that the diagnosis itself is confusing. I think a lot of times it's because it's a serious diagnosis, it is misdiagnosed more often. Um, people will either diagnose particularly younger children as having ADHD because of the comorbidity of symptoms um, and they hold off on a bipolar disorder diagnosis until the child is older just because of the seriousness of it. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about getting diagnosed, but um, here are the two states, um, bipolar, um, used to also be referred to as, as manic depressive disorder. Um, they're either one state or the other, and one of these things that's usually common with children as opposed to with adults with bipolar is that they're what's called rapid cycling. So they could go through, go from being in a very manic state one minute to being in a very depressive state the next minute. Um, and for some kids I've seen that can happen several times a day 
where with adults it has a tendency to be longer time frames that they're in one state or the other. Um, so here's just a look at some of the um, different symptoms of both of them. Um, the manic state, I've always laughed that I wish I had a manic state, I'd get a lot more accomplished. I'd get rooms painted and everything, but this is really something to the extreme. Um, and safety can be a big issue with this, particularly if they think they can do everything. They can fly off buildings or have delusions. Um, you know, you'll see the racing thoughts, they'll talk loudly, um, attempt at multitasking things. Um, I also find in this state, however, a lot of things don't get accomplished because they're trying to multitask. Um, and as opposed to the depressive state where, again, it's just the same, same thing as depression, but they're alternating between the two states. Um, so you you need to kind of keep an eye on, is the child actually in a depressive state or might this actually be a bipolar um, situation? Uh, we talked before about some similarities between diagnosis and the ADHD and the bipolar. Um, so on the top is listed the, some of the similarities, the impulsivity. Um, and impulsivity doesn't just mean an energy level of a kid who can't sit in a seat. Um, it can be impulsivity in um, running in a parking lot, running out between cars and all of a sudden um, not thinking that there's a car coming towards them, um, not paying attention to what's happening around them or what their personal space is so they constantly bump into each other. Um, the um, behavioral and emotional um, fluctuation that kids go through um, happens in both of these diagnoses. It's the differences between the two that really separate out. Um, and one of the big differences that you can see for a kid who has ADHD who has a meltdown or an outburst, they usually last for a very short period of time. 30 minutes may seem like forever, but in, in consideration of um, what it is in a bipolar kid. Um, I have known bipolar kids to have durations of outbursts and, and very aggressive outbursts for up to four hours. Then usually what ends up happening is that they end up crashing, falling asleep, and the other part of it, the next thing that it says is that they have no memory of the outburst because they were in such a dissociative state at the time. They were so um, ramped up in their outbursts that they don't remember things that were said or done um, and they quietly fall asleep and wake up in a different state. Um, that doesn't necessarily happen with a kid with ADHD. Um, so you can just take a look at the different um, lists of differences and you'll also notice as I flip to the next screen, there are still much more differences um, to be listed um, and these are um, what's listed on the screen actually are, are the um, bipolar um, issues. So it really is commonly confused, misdiagnosed, um, and so a lot of times you'll see um, listed on diagnosis mood disorders not otherwise specified um, because that's it's almost a stepping stone. I can You can read through kids' histories and you'll see that they've been diagnosed with ADHD when they're younger, then it turns into mood disorder not otherwise specified, and then later on it'll be clarified as bipolar. And bipolar is even broken out to bipolar manic, bipolar depressive, um, or not otherwise specified. Um, between that. So don't be surprised if it's not actually sometimes that the diagnosis keeps changing, um, but the fact that we, um, that they, as the child progresses, the diagnosis ramps up to what the diagnosis should have been. So I'm going to turn things over to Janie um, as our trauma expert and let her talk about some of the tra trauma and stress-related disorders. Thank you, Mary Beth. Um, we probably, no, nope, maybe not everybody knows, but just recently something came out called the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. Um, there was a lot of controversy around it um, as far as trauma-related disorders. Uh, a lot of people were really getting involved as far as what it should be called. Um, the pe people at DSM-5 um, did not really put in what most 
professionals believe to be the true di the true definition of complex childhood trauma. Um, but what is stated in the DSM-5 at this point, and that is the newest diagnostic manual, um, they have two things that are relevant to this discussion. Mary Beth had talked about the reactive attachment disorder, um, and the main uh, symptom of that is the, an emotionally withdrawn behavior toward adult caregivers. Um, and um, also they have in DSM-5 that uh, something called post-traumatic stress disorder, which we are all familiar with, but they included a PTSD for children six years and younger. Um, and the uh, symptoms for PTSD for kids six years and younger um, are very different from PTSD for some, someone like a veteran coming back from war. But I think what I am seeing more frequently among the professionals that deal with trauma is that complex childhood trauma takes in a far greater list of symptoms and is more pervasive. Um, reactive attachment disorder really is a symptom of a lot of kids with complex childhood trauma, as are the symptoms of PTSD. So even though they didn't call it what it is, it is complex childhood trauma. And um, if you're interested in further information about that, of course, um, we do give um, a lot of trainings on that also in the community. So um, this is just taken from that particular uh, presentation that I do. These are some of the manifestations of complex childhood trauma, um, impaired language and communication, uh, and that is, this is all coming from very early trauma between zero and two and a half or so. Um, but it has an impact um, throughout life. Um, difficulty organizing materials, understanding cause and effect, um, taking another's perspective, um, inattentiveness to classroom tasks. These are all the symptoms that we would see in a classroom and would have an impact on eligibility for an IEP. Trouble regulating emotions and uh, an impaired executive functioning. So like Mary Beth had been talking about, there's a lot of comorbidity between complex childhood trauma and many other diagnoses like bipolar, ADHD, depression, and anxiety. It's kind of a whole mix of those things. Um, but the common misdiagnosis for especially younger kids, is that trauma looks a lot like ADHD, and many times kids are given that diagnosis and medicated. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, they've, they're, hitting the, um, they're hitting the actual syndrome. Um, okay, I think I, that's it for me for now. Um, <laughs> so go ahead, Mary Beth. <laughs> Okay, I wanted to touch briefly on some community-based services um, because school is considered part of that um, community-based services. So um, there um, was a lawsuit that had taken place a while back in the state of Massachusetts by some parents who um, had a um, complaint about the fact that their kids were on uh, mass health and were not able to get services for their children the way that um, somebody with private insurance could. So they created what's called the Child Behavioral Health Initiative, and that's what the mis this mission is about. That's what CBHI stands for, um, and it's it's a state-based service, though other states have something similar to this. Um, the important things are the, are the one's in color, it is comprehensive, it is community-based, it's trying to keep children in their school system and in their home as opposed to having to put them into residential placements. Um, and it is for kids with significant emotional and mental health needs. So who's eligible? Um, this is actually a program, like I said, it was started with parents um, who had mass health. So it's a requirement for that you have mass health in order to do this, which we'll get into in a second. Um, it is for children under the age of 21. So even if you're, you have a 19-year-old, they're still eligible for these services. Um, and there needs to be a significant emotional impairment um, in order to receive the services. Um, a menu of services that are available. Intensive care coordination. This is um, a usually a clinician who um, is trained to be able to work with other providers and, do, and does a lot of coordination or case management work for a family. There's the in-home therapy, which um, 
this is something that also uh, is beneficial as far as the school is concerned because the in-home therapists do what it says is come and does the therapy in home, but they can also work with the school so that you have um, you're using the same language at home that you're using at school, so that uh, the school counselors are consulting with them. Um, in home behavioral services um, it speaks for itself. It's the benefit of having clinicians be in your home as opposed to in an office and only hearing. Um, the perspective of the parent or the child. This way they get to see them. So, um, family partner is something that's beneficial. As I said, I was a family partner. It's done by somebody who in fact has um, lived experience um, of having a child with mental health issues and they are there to support the parents. Um, therapeutic mentoring is a one-on-one -on -one mentoring service where the child is paired up with somebody and it's like a big brother but they work on actual um, treatment plans so they're working to, on a mental health goal. And the last one, important one, is the mobile crisis intervention. Um, this is a team of a clinician and a family partner that are able to be mobile. They can come to your home. Most importantly, to be known, they can come to the school. If your child has been unsafe in the school and needs to be evaluated to, for possible hospitalization or other services, um, mobile crisis can be called by the school. Um, and come out to the school and do the evaluation there. They can do it at the mall. They can do it wherever, you're, wherever is necessary. Um, if you have any questions about this um, or getting MassHealth to be able to um, access these services or for your, any of your clients, this would be uh, the number to call um, and speak to somebody here at the Federation who can help you go through that process because there are certain types of mass health that you have to have in order to gain these services. So feel free to give Mass Family Voices a call and they'd be happy to do that. So the important part getting to the curriculum. Um, as you can see by the list, these are common problems that come up with kids, um, school attendance, um, very low self-esteem, oppositional behaviors. Um, so these are usually the um, things the school is seeing that need to be addressed, so the needs of the child. Um, so for to get mental health um, on an IEP for social and emotional, there needs to be a diagnosis from a credentialed professional. Um, and the earlier that you can do this, the better if you're starting to see these behaviors in a young child. Um, uh, any incident reports of anything that's happened at the school is very important um, because you want the school to acknowledge the fact that these are behaviors that are impacting the school life as well. Parent-teacher observations and a solid neuropsych with um, recommendations is great. Mary Beth, I just want to jump in and say that the diagnosis is actually not required to be on an IEP. It's helpful for kids with, those, with these invisible di um, disabilities to have a diagnosis, and we do certainly recommend uh, a neuropsychological neuropsych evaluation. But more and more schools are beginning to recognize that kids have social emotional um, disabilities from many different places. And um, one of the things that our program is uh, getting very good at is to explain to uh, IEP teams that it's possible that we have an undiagnosed trauma situation mm -hmm. here or something that is invisible and has an impact on social emotional development. Mm -hmm. And I, I've had clients too that, that don't have a diagnosis yet but are getting a social emotional IEP. So um, just a, this is a quick look through of, um, as I said before, behavioral versus manifestation. A lot of times they'll say that there's behavioral issues when in fact a lot of these things are things that are manifestations of problems that the kids are facing but they don't have the language to be able to deal with the emotions without it becoming a behavioral thing. Um, and I will just quickly go through the list um, and you can take a look at most of these things are common um, experiences that you hear about or people, you know, teachers are complaining um, or in, you'll be seeing incident reports. And a lot of these behaviors that we see um, are some of the more challenging behaviors in the classroom and 
don't have easy fixes. Um, sometimes it, it um, is requiring a complete shift in uh, the school climate or the classroom climate, um, and that is one of the reasons why um, the Safe and Supportive School Act was just passed in October to begin to take care of these holistic types of things in the, in the whole districts um, and to make it easier for these kids to be successful, not only um, with the academic um, curriculum, but with the life of the school as a whole. And I think that's key, the life of the school as a whole. Um, for everyone um, who is listening, there is going to be a follow-up um, email going out to everybody. Um, one of them happens to be a list of accommodations that are um, just ideas to get people thinking about the possibility of what some of the accommodations for somebody on who has an IEP um, can take a look at. So that will go out afterwards. Um, I didn't want to tie up the time with going through that list. Um, I want to talk briefly about incentive plans um, or behavioral plans. Do they work? They don't work. This is actually very, um, it depends on the child and it depends on the issue that you're looking for. Um, and these are some of the things I think it's important to look at what is the purpose of the plan, what is the symptom that they have. Um, or, or the behavior that, that you're looking at. Um, will the plan actually work to modify the behavior, or is it just a list of expectations that the child knows that what you're expecting of them? Um, and many, child, many children with complex trauma, um, you know, the, the consequences are not effective for them. Um, they have had such experiences that any um, consequence that you give them actually it seems minimal to them. So it's a lot of times they're not very effective, but it depends on the child and what situation you're looking at. So just to keep that in mind that it may be a good thing and it may not be. So here's also some um, options that you might be looking towards um, to help with uh, building a good IEP is possibly having a functional behavioral assessment done. Um, uh, I'll have Janie jump in here too about the social emotional learning curriculum um, because that's definitely something that I think we're trying to get schools to understand more often. Um, do you want me to speak yeah. to that now, Mary Beth? Okay. So the social emotional learning curriculum is part of the uh, the mainframes um, in uh, in Massachusetts. It was passed as part of the anti bullying law in 2011. Uh, so that was four, three, four years ago, um, and it was a little bit slow to launch in a lot of the school districts, but it is there, and it's done very well. It's done in a very developmentally appropriate way for kids from preschool up through high school, um, and it is available on the RTSC website. Um, as well as on the DOE site, but um, everybody should be aware of it, and this is, uh, this is what schools should be looking at when they are putting kids on IEPs, and um, you can base a lot of the goals on what they're, they talk about in the social-emotional learning curriculum. Um, and I think I just wanted to back up a little bit. There was a question um, of someone about an incentive plan. Um, mm -hmm. They're not familiar with what it is, and I think quickly we can just say it's the positive reward plans, mm -hmm. yep. star charts, um, point systems, those kinds of things. So they're positive in intention, but sometimes have a, um, a negative impact on the kids with mental health issues. And particularly kids with low self-esteem. Um, I, I know that from personal experience that for one of of our children, it was just a list of failures for her, um, and that just made things absolutely worse uh, rather than better. So, um, other services, what are some? Other, what do they look like? Um, here are just a list of things that um, you will you can utilize as far as again depending on what the needs of the child is. Maybe they need some counseling, maybe they don't. Um, are there communication issues? For a lot of kids, the communication issues basically are a lack of social skills. Um, the, there is in fact um, the capacity for parent counseling and training in a lot of places. Um, so this is just a list of things that you can look at. The rehabilitation services are really looking at children who are older. Obviously, we don't need to look at career development for a five-year-old, um, but those are some other services um, that are, are available. 
for most people that understand, the, um, we just wanted to throw this slide in so that people who weren't necessarily familiar with the, what a least restrictive environment looks like, this is really the pattern to go with, with the inclusion classroom being the least restrictive and the therapeutic school being the most restrictive. Again, it really, what is least restrictive for a child is based on that child's need, not, not a general assumption. We did have a question uh, about what would a therapeutic placement look like, um, and uh, I think the person who is asking the question can kind of see that it, it can look like a lot of different things. Um, therapeutic schools is the most restrictive environment for these kids, and it's usually kids who have severe mental health issues. Um, and you might also add a um, you know, intensive residential therapeutic um, place where uh, kids are actually um, highly suicidal or homicidal, so that, that is a whole different, more restrictive environment, and um, unfortunately, there's too many, a lot of kids in those places. Right. Um, so I just wanted to clarify for that person that that's what a therapeutic placement looks like. Yeah, and that could be a whole different conversation, too, to have, so um, calling Janie and, and talking about that, you know, specific questions about that may be the best way to go. Um, I'm going to ask, actually, Janie, to go over this system. Um, when we get into tiered systems of support, um, we're talking about how to support the kid, particularly um, in doing this eh, proactively, that's the word I'm looking for, so that it, we're not looking at discipline issues. Right. So the Massachusetts tiered system of support um, is... A, there's, there's a lot of similar things like this. There's re response to intervention. It's um, all kinds of different names throughout the country. The, they're all based on a pyramid, and at the bottom of the pyramid is the Tier 1, which means that all kids uh, will get any kind of supports that they need. These are called, these are holistic supports. They're not necessarily academic. They're all different kinds of supports. So if a kid is having a bad day, it sh should be identified as quickly as possible, either through a communication lock with the adults or the bus driver or whatever. Um, and the staff at the school, including all staff, will be responsive to taking care of the needs of that child in that particular day. Tier 2 are kids that need maybe a little bit more supports and, and more uh, of a, a longer time frame. Um, and they can be on uh, 504s for accommodations. They could be on IEPs, but they don't have the ex um, intensive needs that Tier 3 have. Most of the kids in Tier 3 will be on an IEP. But I think the fluidity of the triangle is that they can go up and down um, according to the place that they're at on any particular day. Um, so that is the tiered system of support, and you can see that this is a beautiful graphic. We did not do this. This is from the <laughs> DOE. Um, and if you take a look at it, you see the different kinds of supports. Okay, so this is this is my one of my favorite um, graphics, and it's a tale of two schools, and it talks to one of the positive behavioral intervention strategies that are out there now, um, called restorative justice. Uh, Boston Public Schools is really working hard to get this up and running in the Boston Public Schools, and it replaces what was known as the zero tolerance educational system. Um, it has come about because of Chapter 222, um, which was passed and put into effect last this July. Um, and it, what it means is that all schools must um, attempt non-putative intervention strategies before any kind of uh, punitive response including suspensions or removals of any kind. So here's just a nice graphic about this particular student, Carl, oh, Carlos, excuse me, um, and the differences between seeing it as a behavior with zero tolerance uh, punishments as opposed to a holistic re um, approach through restorative practices or safe and supportive schools. Um, and you can take a look at it, and I think it's pretty obvious that the ones on the right are much better for Carlos and have much better outcomes. And the, the most of the um, schools that are implementing are finding this to be very successful and actually less time consuming than um, uh, the previous program and keeps the kids in school more often. So writing strong and measurable goals, um, one of the, uh, the easiest ways to remember is to try and do it in a smart method. Be specific, 
Um, the goals should be measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about um, that in creating strong goals. Um, Jenny, you actually you want to address this one? Sure. Um, and just so that you know, we do have uh, we have done a webinar on writing social emotional goals, which is up on our website, um, the RTSC website. Um, and they all are around. They're based on the social emotional learning curriculum. So, and what what you look at when writing social emotional goals is to to identify the skill deficit. Where where are the skills? lacking that we need to increase in order for this child to be um, to have better outcomes from behavior. Um, and in the goal, you want to make sure that it's very specific about what's going to be um, accomplished, who's going to do it, who will be accountable for uh, helping the child, and who will be accountable for measuring it. That can be the child themselves. That can be a self-monitoring um, type of thing, and that's usually very effective. Um, so those are the things that we um, have at the Federation really are very strong on. And I think we're going to go through a couple of goals, but as I say, if you do have questions about this, please look at our web webinar on it where we went through, I think, four or five goals that you can kind of base your own goals on. Mm -hmm. So here's, um, we thought we'd give a, a little case scenario here um, about eight-year-old Joe, um, who is uh, a student who, when he becomes frustrated, starts fights with one of his classmates, um, which would normally uh, get him thrown out. But he, if we direct it in a goal sense, what would be a strong measurable goal for Joe? So we're going to help with answering that, um, <laughs> uh, just so, just because of the webinar point. So we want to look in um, in response to the challenging classroom material. Joe will use a three-question self-monitoring tool every day as monitored by his teacher. So this would actually be the goal itself. So why don't we take a look at some of the benchmarks? Um, that are ways that, that we can actually see whether that's happening. And I've uh, changed the, the color of them because it, each of the colors indicating what parts we're looking at for them to be strong. Who's going to do it? How long is it going to be for? What is it that we're looking to target? Um, and how is it going to be handled? Um, so that is one benchmark listed for Joe. Here's a second one. Um, and as you can see, this is a it, this is somewhat of a linear uh, benchmark. So we start out by the end of the first quarter. Now we're looking at the end of the second marking period um, that he's going to be able to do it more often um, and with less prompts from the teacher. So they've put really uh, precise time frames on this. And for the third benchmark. Um, and again, this is being monitored. He's the one utilizing the tool, but it's being monitored by his teacher. So there's still that accountability if he's not doing that. Um, another case, um, and these are well-written um, goals that have been worked on here at the Federation. So, so when Maria cries because um, she's not being flexible and her other friends don't want to play with her, what would be a strong measurable goal for Maria? I'm sorry, Marie. So uh, are we thinking that uh, for Marie or for Maria, do, do we want to um, have the people, uh, have the audience actually come up with some ideas? If they could do that, that would be great. OK, let's go back to Marie um, and talk about, oops. You're going the wrong way. <laughs> go, the, uh, go the right way. Okay. Now I've lost my arrow, so hold on one second. All the way out and come back. There you go. All right. So um, here's here's the scenario. She is a um, a little one. She's five years old. Um, and as many kids that we know at this age, when she becomes frustrated. Um, or I'm sorry, the other kids become frustrated because she wants to, to rule the roost. She wants to be in charge. Um, she wants to do what Maria wants to do. So if you have any ideas out there, um, we'll give you some help. What would be a strong measurable goal for Marie? This is a strong annual measurable goal. <laughs> All right, we're going to give you a couple of minutes. Um, 
And can you just take over for a minute? Sure. Okay. And help people to think about this. So again, what is what are we targeting? Uh, would be the key here to start with. So in setting the goal, we we just want to state what that act, the goal actually is to start with. And feel free to type in the answers. Um, we do have somebody here who is reading them and sending them in. So excellent. We have some answers. Okay. All right. So we do have someone who is very brave and said that Marie, uh, Maria, Marie will attempt to play by someone else's rules in two out of three attempts during um, free play. It's a great, great um, annual goal, um, and essentially that was what we had come up with. Our annual goal was during recess, which is free play. Uh, Maria will use active listening four out of five times as monitored by your teacher. So essentially, we both came up with the same thing, different, different measuring um, uh, paradigms, but that's fine. Um, and then the bench, um, the benchmarks for her. We like benchmarks because they are linear, um, and I seem to do things in a linear way. Um, what we would have said for the first marking period was that she would uh, work with an adjustment counselor to identify um, uh, and discuss behaviors that cause other students to become angry. And you know what? Some would just say, "How is active listening measurable?" And I like that. It's not really. Um, it's it's something that we should probably think about because first of all it has to be defined. Um, but um, I like that someone says they play by someone else's rules. That's a much better way to write the goal. Anyway, for the benchmarks, um, the second benchmark would be that she was would be Maria would be willing to listen to the opinions of other students without interrupting three out of five times as monitored by her teacher. So the adjustment counselor is now out of the picture and the teacher um, becomes the monitor. And then by the third uh, benchmark, which is the end of the academic year, Maria will listen to the opinions of others uh, without interrupting four out of five times as monitored by her teacher. So, And this is a final goal that we talked about. Um, uh, final case, one 13-year-old Wanda returns from counseling and family visits. She's impatient with her classmates, doesn't wait her turn, and can become aggressive if she doesn't get her way. What is a strong, measurable goal for Wanda? Does anybody want to give it a shot out there? Give you a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds, actually. I think we're running short on time. We're about at the end. Of we're about at the end. Okay. So I will give you the answer because we want to um, maybe address a couple other things. Um, so our goal that we came up with would be uh, Wanda will learn how to compartmentalize her feelings that, so that she does not disrupt class after family visits and counseling sessions. That's her annual goal. Again, how do we uh, define compartmentalize? That would be a good question. Um, and someone is acting, asking, do teachers have the time to actually count four out of five times? Um, you don't probably have to do it every time these situations occur, but um, applied behavioral analysis would say you take a sampling of that over um, you know several days, um, and it, it's pretty easy to do. I used when I was teaching, I would have um, paper clips in one pocket, and then whenever I would see, when I was doing my sampling, I'd take one paper clip out of one pocket and put it in the other pocket so that I, um, whatever I was measuring, I would have the um, actual results in one pocket or the other. It's a great idea. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, oh, here's another one. So this is great. Wanda will wait for a 10 count before responding to non-preferred interaction without peers. Awesome. That's somebody who I bet is a clinician. Um, <laughs> um, and then four to five times during social interaction. So you guys sound like you know what you're doing out there. Um, we did an object, objectives with this one. Um, objectives differ from benchmarks in that they are not linear. Uh, they're more uh, uh, 
goal, not goal specific, more activity specific. So the three objectives that we had for WANDA were that during meetings, again, with the social adjust, the school adjustment counselor, she will use drawing and cartoon visualization tools to describe how she feels after family visits. Um, and that is cognitive behavioral therapy um, for your clinicians out there. Um, and it's usually very effective for the little ones, especially if they can draw. Um, and then another objective is in the classroom, uh, when Wanda realizes that she can't engage appropriately. She'll place a cue on her desk, like a plastic crab. I love that. I mean, she's crabby. We actually have one of those here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that is a great way. It's a cueing. It's not stigmatizing. Um, it uses a, a manipulative. There's a lot of great ways, great things about using that kind of stuff for a little one. Um, and then the, the final objective is that Wanda will manage her feelings while she's in class so as not to disrupt. Um, and that is, of course, her final um, agenda. So um, I think we're almost at the end yeah. here. Beth. OK, so I'm just taking a quick look at the questions here. We may have to answer these offline. Um, but uh, let's see. There, there was a question about an FBA, um, about a, a be particular um, behavior for a child and do uh, does an FBA um, take place at the school or in other domains? A good FBA should be in all the domains where the behavior occurs. Um, a, a behavioralist will go to, especially if it has to do with the bus, will look at the beginning of the bus ride, during the bus ride, the end of the bus ride, and what on, went on before the bus ride and what goes on after the bus ride. So it's a full look at the behavior. Some schools don't have the time or the capacity to do that, um, but you can certainly um, ask for it and recommend it and maybe get someone in the community to do it. Um, and that's one of the things that, for example, the CBHI people would be able to do. Um, the, someone wanted to know the act that was passed um, that I referred to. It was actually passed in I uh, believe in August, and it's the Safe and Supportive School Act. Um, and if you go, uh, if you just Google Safe and Supportive School Act in Massachusetts, it will come up. It's also um, in line with Chapter 222, and it talks to, or it speaks to the new paradigm shift in Massachusetts going towards empathic schools, empathic um, approaches to kids, keeping them in school, not having that push out um, where they go out and don't come back and end up um, on the prison uh, pipeline. All right, I think we may be done. Um, and again, if you have any further questions, please email either myself, jcreco at fcsn.org or M, what is yours? MB Landy. MB Landy, L A N D Y, yes. no R Y, it's D Y. D Y. Yes, at fcsn.org, or you can always email um, Hannah at RTSC. And also, please feel free at any time. We have many advocates, even lawyers, um, and uh, school personnel, clinicians that will call the call center to get those questions answered as well. Okay. And then, I'm sorry, the number for that is 617-236-7210. Okay, and I think we have our final slide, which says thank you. And I will be sending out a survey monkey um, this afternoon. And if you have the time, it's only three questions. It's real easy. It's great for our stats. Um, and we will see you next month. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>